stirred up racial hatred. You know, this is, and I can't stress that enough, police action over an interview with the threat of arrest and imprisonment. And that must have serious repercussions for freedom of expression and is simply unjustifiable. If we go down this route, we are no better in my eyes than a state that doesn't enshrine freedom of the press within its its society and life and democracy, like Russia, for example, or Iran, you know. Hi, Darren. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, no, I'm sure our audience would love to hear sort of your version of events of what's go- about what's going on at the moment. Obviously, you've had um, sort of some harassment from the police. Would you sort of elaborate on what's been happening and your sort of response to this? I, I will. I, I'll tell you all of that. But I, did you see this morning that on the Jeremy Vine show on Channel 5, Yasmin Alibi Brown um, has been arguing that Lawrence Fox basically can be judged on the colour of his skin and who his parents are and not on his ideas or the content of his character. Now, the reason why I tell you that story to to open is because I think it highlights the the danger of the precedent that the police are setting by investigating me over an interview. I vehemently disagree with Yasmin Alibi Brown. I actually argue, I would argue that some of the things that she says are actually quite racist themselves. You know, the idea that you can judge someone on their on the colour of their skin is an inherently racist idea. It's just that's the definition. And if we end up in a position where an interviewer like Jeremy Vine can be arrested for views that his guests have have put across on his show, that has a real chilling effect on, on free speech and debate. So I, you know, I, I would just ask your viewers and I guess sections of the media themselves who might hate Darren Grimes with every fibre of their being and think I'm an objectionable cultural conservative to just look at the precedent that that's setting. I wouldn't have Yasmin Alibi Brown reported to the police. I don't think she should face seven years in prison, which is the maximum sentence that I face at the moment, by the way. So just think about that for a second. Absolutely terrifying, isn't it? But anyway, you asked me a question, so I will actually answer it now. Now, the police contacted me last week. uh, What day is it? Wednesday, so a week ago and asked if I'd come to be interviewed at a police station under caution and threatened with arrest if I refuse. Now, I'm going to be interviewed on Friday. I'll update Turning Point and everyone else uh, with whatever happens after that. But I'm accused of uh, it being in contravention of the Public Order Act, which criminalises the stirring up of racial hatred. And as I say, it carries with it a seven-year maximum sentence. Now, that act is intended to preserve public order. I don't think Margaret Thatcher, when she passed that, or when her Home Secretary Douglas Hurd passed that in 1986, they were sat there rubbing their hands with glee, thinking, oh, goody, goody, we'll be able to regulate the speech and debate of Darren Grimes and Dr. David Starkey. You know, not that I was alive in 1986, (laughs) but you get the point. So this is an unprecedented use, according to my solicitor, who's a top criminal solicitor he says that this is an unprecedented use of that legislation and really that it should concern anyone who believes in in freedom of the press and i don't think you can highlight that any clearer than in the fact that a communist like ash Sarka to a liberal democrat like tim farron are taking issue with the police decision to investigate me uh, because they recognise, as indeed does Lord MacDonald, the former Director of Public Prosecutions, that actually we're setting, a, and I quote Lord MacDonald here, sinister and foolish and deeply threatening a free speech decision by the Metropolitan Police to investigate me over an interview. So that's where we're at. Oh, definitely. I think, why don't everything too, it's, again, obviously what... Dr. Starkey said wasn't particularly nice. It wasn't sort of mm. the language you'd hope to hear that he would have used, but it's, mm. why didn't that, it's, it's an attack on you. It's nothing about stirring up racial hatred. I'd say mm. the police actually don't care whether he did stir up racial hatred or not. They're only using it to attack you, to bring you down because you're one of the most well-known young conservative commentators out there. Um, so it's completely shocking to see a state attack on someone that's sort of as promising as yourself and someone who has as wide an audience as yourself just to shut you down. 
Well, look, Jack, I think at a time when many in our country are facing uncertainty and financial hardship, you know, let's be absolutely clear that the consequences of the go-to policy to combat coronavirus being lockdowns, there are many facing destitution, financial destitution, and young people are seeing their opportunities destroyed. And at a time like this, I can't imagine a more contemptible way for the Metropolitan Police to abuse taxpayer cash by investigating this vexatious claim that I've stirred up racial hatred. You know, this is, and I can't stress that enough, police action over an interview with the threat of arrest and imprisonment. And that must have serious repercussions for freedom of expression and is simply unjustifiable. If we go down this route, we are no better in my eyes than a state that doesn't enshrine freedom of the press within its its society and life and democracy, like Russia, for example, or Iran. You know, this, this is really that extraordinary in my eyes. Um, so, yes, I, I don't know what, what it says about us, but listen, I am willing to fight this all of the way. I, I think that... Um, They've, they've picked on the wrong bloke, to be honest with you. You know, the, this is my second Metropolitan Police investigation this year. <laughs> um, there's a running joke in my family, actually, Jack, and you'll like this because I've got two brothers and one of them is 11 months younger than I am. And uh, he was excluded from school, uh, I think a couple of times, actually. So there was always a running joke that I was the the promising child and that I would I would do well out of life turns out that I'm the one who's been investigated by the police twice and he's uh, he's as good as gold um funny how things work out isn't it but I I'm definitely willing to to fight this because I think the precedent will mean that the next generation of political commentators who might be starting their own podcasts you know it's very it's very easy to do now and and good for them i think diversity in the media is a fantastic thing and to be encouraged but we put that in jeopardy we put that at risk if people genuinely fear interviewing someone with controversial views for fear of repercussion because some lefty activist has made a vexatious complaint about them to the police that then sees them drag through months if not years of litigation that would that would have a severe chilling effect on free expression and freedom of the press and it's one that i am not willing to to stand for so i will be fighting it all of the way and i i you know can't thank tp uk uh, supporters enough because i know a lot of you have been tweeting like mad about this over the past week uh, so thank you um, but yes i'm going to fight on and on well, no, and yeah, no, we're very happy to support you because, as I said, you're a great sort of leader in the sort of young conservative movement, also the wider conservative movement. But the fact is, if they're coming after you and they're successful against you, they mm. can come after us as exactly. well. And we don't yeah. want any yeah. of that. And this is it's a very slippery slope, mm -hmm. um, what's happening here. And especially, I think you highlighted it there. Um, this isn't just the police deciding to do it. It's some lefty attack on you. Some yeah. lefties decided yeah. they're going to cause a problem by accusing you and if we're sort of playing this game where the police can't dismiss accusations based on um for political reasons it, again do i accuse keir starmer of being racist is he going to be arrested mm -hmm. have that sort of racial hatred label hanging over him are we going to get jeremy corbyn done for all his anti-semitic comments that he's had in the past with the anti-semitic groups that he's hosted it's we've got to draw a line somewhere and say you can't use the police for political reasons it's got a, a genuine crime has to have been committed you can't just start using them like your own personal army exactly and and i mean at a time when i've had so many emails from people saying you know i was uh, mugged uh, you know someone took my phone in broad daylight uh, i my car has been stolen i was burgled and i went to the police and on each occasion Obviously, these are different individuals, not some poor and lucky sod having all of this happen to them, but different individuals with, with very similar stories. And all of them ended up with the police saying, nothing we can do, we're overstretched, it's Tory cuts. Yet they can find the money to investigate a vexatious claim like this. 
and you know i think set a really dangerous precedent in doing so because let's be clear and I'm at risk of repeating myself in in a free and democratic society it's absolutely paramount that journalists and broadcasters no matter if it's one as big and popular as I, I did Good Morning Britain the other the other day, or as small and YouTube based as Reasoned UK, we have to or Turning Point, we have to be permitted to interview a wide range of people, including those likely to make controversial remarks. You know, are we going to get off this call in the next hour, Jack? And you, you face arrest for, for daring to interview me. <laughs> you might get you might you might <laughs> and, same with that turning point we've hosted events obviously live campus events where we've had people shouting these are the hands that are going to be wrapped around your throat and strangle you and so are we going to get prosecuted because we broadcasted aggressive aggressive behavior directed at us from the left we already see this sort of stuff on facebook where if you publish quotes from people like corbyn or um left-wing extremists which are sort of unfavorable you're the one who gets penalized despite the fact it's their words going out there and you're criticizing mm. them for it and it's, it's shocking to see this happening in wider society as well um mm -hmm. but i guess wider than all of this do you think there is a sort of institutional left-wing bias in the police or do you think this is like a one-off vendetta incident uh that's a very good question i mean i i will be keen once this is uh, all over, and I have not genuinely no idea when that will be, um, I'll be very keen to know why the Metropolitan Police and the Crown Prosecution Service have reached the, the decision to actually go ahead with the investigation. You know, I'm, I'm very keen to find that out uh if i can well, certainly as well what you say before on twitter all the time you get sort of left-wing troll accounts tweeting sexual abuse at you fantasizing about you in disgusting sort of scenarios but they're yeah, not being yeah. prosecuted and um, no i i think you're right actually that's that's one phenomenon that i've had uh a lot of uh, so for those that don't know for the past four years you know i've been in continuous litigation uh i was investigated by the electoral commission three times and then uh, there was a court case after the third decision and uh, a metropolitan police investigation. And during all of that, during those four years, from those who have FBPE in their name, followed back pro-EU, uh, and those who uh, profess or, or self-declare themselves as, as liberal and progressive, from these people, these so-called liberals and progressives, I would receive a deluge of tweets saying, I hope, I, you know, I hope you get raped in prison. Uh, and, and just re actually borderline homophobic as well, a lot of it. And it's not a really liberal or progressive point of view, is it? But the problem is, Jack, I would never, ever consider reporting these people to the police because I just sort of think, well, you know, you're some sad sod that's probably living in, in their basement. man's basement. You exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I just think, let them get on with it. I couldn't give a toss. And um, and that's fine. That's just the way I am. But the, I think we all have to be a little bit more like that, actually, because the way in which we advance as a society, the way in which we advance debate and reach conclusions uh, that unite the nation is through debate and speech. You know, the best way to vaccinate yourself against views that you find objectionable is through further discourse um and i'm afraid free speech is under attack like never before in my opinion you know this isn't the police finally enforcing the law as has been argued the public order act was never intended to regulate discussion and debate yet it's being used to do that in this scenario that's pretty terrifying to me um and again, I, I stress that that really dangerous precedent it sets will have a real chilling effect, not just on conservative minded channels like ours, but in a wider sense in the whole sector, the media sector itself. That's why people like Piers Morgan are so worried about it as well. Oh, definitely. Um, but I think it's one of those things I'd be very surprised if the police start using it to go after the BBC or ITV, they're using it to shut yeah, people right. such to yourself down. I, I think um, that's fair. The BBC didn't even report it, Jack, at first. 
Yeah, well, no, it's shocking. And again, I saw you had to put a lot of pressure on them online yeah. to actually get them talking about it. Yeah. But they were the ones who were putting the knife into you about David Starkey when it wasn't even you who said the thing. I mean, um, it's, it's which... sort of unsurprising, right, given that I have spent the last, uh, well, especially lockdown, campaigning for defund the BBC. Uh, they, I, it, you know, it's no surprise that they hate me, but it's the fact that the, it's the BBC's job to inform the nation. And I think the nation should be informed about something like this. I don't, and I don't say that because I'm a absolute massive narcissist. I say that because I really do think that for the BBC and smaller outlets, if this sort of thing is allowed to stand, then who's next? But I do think you're right that there is a disparity between those on the left, like the Sophie, uh, I can't remember Sophie's. It was even Sophie that Duker? comedy show, um, Frank, Frankie Boyle's exactly, show. Exactly, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Where he broadcasted um, the lady who said, oh, we don't want to kill all whiteies. Oh, we do. On national TV, and that's allowed. Are they going to be get, getting done now for broadcasting that? It, again, it's, <laughs> what's if, going if on? Yeah, if their law was equally applied, they would be. But I hope... I genuinely hope they're not because I don't think people should be arrested for this you know despite the fact that and I said this uh, on Good Morning Britain the other day when I was on with Professor Andrews who says that whiteness is a psychosis I I said to Professor Andrews listen I vehemently disagree with everything that you say but the last thing I think should happen to you is you face arrest you know I will just tell you why I think that your ideas are wrong and why you far from um, seeking to highlight racism or actually seeking to divide a country that enjoys fantastic race relations. You know, you are someone, I think, who was doing more to divide than you are to unite. Um, and I want to be able to challenge him on, on forums like Good Morning Britain and elsewhere. I think that's, that's what a healthy democracy does. That's what a society which that's enshrines true. free expression and free speech uh, actually does. That's how you advance debate and discourse. You well, don't shut there's... it down and accuse people of criminal acts. Definitely. And historically, there's a reason we've never had far right or far left governments in this country yeah. because Nick we've Griffin always had been a good ability. example yeah exactly we've had the ability to debate these people and make them look stupid mm -hmm. on national tv not censoring them because when you censor people um real extremists um they go underground and they gain larger followings because exactly. people say um oh the government's censoring us because they're worried we're speaking the truth but if you can get them on tv and you will humiliate them by letting them express their extremist views most people will think this guy's absolutely nuts <laughs> we're not following him and that's the best way to make sure that we have a sensible country, a sensible country which respects freedom of speech and doesn't endorse these far right or far left organisations. And I, I mean, I've heard as well that the even the upper echelons of the police now are, are being told about this. And if you ask me, it's an absolutely, uh, it's just a really terrible waste of valuable police time. You know, the police are always complaining that cuts make it impossible, Tory cuts make it impossible for them to investigate burglaries or automobile theft. How then do they have time for these, what are politically motivated witch hunts? It's just... Yeah, well, as I said, I'm from Portsmouth and certainly in my community, people don't bother calling the police anymore because, you know, they're useless. That's in terrible. Again, not saying that there aren't good police officers out there, there are. But the fact is, lots of them, they think, oh, there's no point investigating this because we won't catch the person. So they go for the, the PR goals, like, oh, could I be the officer that brings down Darren Grimes because I get mm. 10 social credit points for that? Or if I can get someone on a trumped-up hate crime charge, whether it's you or someone else, they love it because it makes them look good and it advances them. So it starts becoming more of a box-ticking or boosting the officer's ego rather than actually catching criminals. And my, my issue is that the Law Commission um, published a report uh, not too long ago in which they go through uh, the for and against arguments for expanding hate crime legislation. That's what's being proposed at the minute. And that the expansion would include things like misogyny. Um, and in my eyes, the job of the police 
But I, I, I am vehemently opposed to expanding hate crime legislation, if anything. You know, if I walk outside and someone smacks my head in for, for being gay, I will be no more upset that they've done it because I'm gay than the fact that I've just had my head kicked in, right? That is a criminal mm. offence, kicking someone's head in. It, the fact that I'm gay it doesn't really come into it. They should be arrested for kicking for my assault. head in. Yeah. Exactly. So... Hate crime legislation, in my eyes, is going too far, and it's actually having a real chilling effect on, on free expression. But putting that to one side, the job of the police should be to get things like uh, burglaries and knife crime down. And that is obviously their, their raison d'etre. But when it comes to hate crime statistics, the police seem intent on having them go higher and higher because the police have got it into their heads that that's how you appear more woke and progressive if your hate crime statistics are booming then you can turn around and say look how fantastic we are we're tackling this you know that those post-brexit bigots uh, that have been unleashed by that vote to leave a supranational uh, governmental organization uh, we are tackling it and hate crime spiraling. Isn't that marvellous? Well, no, actually, it's not. Well, you, you, know, you should from... be focusing on actual crime, not thought crime. Definitely. And I think what I heard about five years ago, and I imagine it's only got, well, sort of unofficially told by a police officer, they'd been given unofficial hate crime quotas to catch. So they were told in certain areas um, they weren't arresting enough people for because there were large amounts of racism in the area, or what they class as racism, and they weren't arresting enough people for hate crime. So it stopped being if um, a white person and a black person had a fight, before that was just two people having a fight, now it's a racial hate crime. And so they're starting to go through all these different avenues to make themselves look good rather than actually investigating crime and stopping real racist acts. Because there are real racists out there. There are yeah, people, of course. obviously yeah. the Stephen Lawrence case which happened, that is something which the police should be investigating and stopping incidents like that happening again. Because that's disgusting and that is real racism which is a scourge on our country. But they shouldn't be going for people like yourself they shouldn't be going for comments online um and really i think we need to toughen up as a nation especially in the digital sphere just because someone comments something negative at you block them you don't need to report them to the police obviously if they keep harassing you there's a case for harassment there but if someone posts something negative once why are you losing sleep over it again certainly i'm sure it's the same for yourself or we mentioned a bit earlier i get death threats i get stupid comments all the time i get people coming on and slagging off um, disabled members of my family but I don't lose any sleep about it because as we discuss, these people are probably in quite sorry conditions themselves. Um, so it's just frustrating that we are so sort of thin skinned in this country. No, I agree. And I, I think the, you know, the, there's a lot to be said for the uh, decline of, of, of Christianity, I think, in, in so many ways of just being completely unable, if we see the reaction to... Uh, to David Starkey himself, right? He he hasn't just been cancelled; he's been airbrushed from history. Uh, and I think all too often we forget about the, the fundamental message of forgiveness uh, that people do ultimately make mistakes. That's one thing that I wish people would be a little bit more aware of. Um, you know, you can in the heat of a moment you can send out a tweet calling someone a I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I won't swear. Um, or tweet Darren Grimes saying, I hope you get raped, and which is a horrible thing to say. Of course it is. Mm. But uh, do, do I sit here and think about it all day long? Do I let it consume me? Do I spend goodness only knows how long it takes to fill out a police report? Do I bother with all of that stuff? Absolutely not. It, it, people have a right to call me whatever they want, as long as they're not actually going to murder me. I, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't care. Um, I think you're right that we do need to toughen up a little bit because uh, it, this is just all, it's taken up too much valuable time. I oh, know, most definitely. And it's frustrating as well, because I think we have two elements here. We have this top-down left-wing policing, which pushed um pushed obviously the officers to take the knee during blm mm -hmm. uh, there's footage out there where it looks like they're all getting radioed to say take the knee to appease the crowd and that's usually concerning that police are infringing their neutrality 
um, uh, neutrality status by taking a political side and making a political statement. And then from there as well, we, we see all this red tape stopping officers from actually doing their jobs where they're not allowed to investigate or keep the peace because of this red tape coming down from the top. So you have good people who are good policemen leaving their career because they're saying it's not like what it used to be. And we're getting this new level of woke officer coming in who's more concerned about going after people such as yourself than stopping real crime. Yes, exactly. I, th I think Martin Daubney, the former Brexit Party MEP, put it really well when he said, you know, the police should be fighting crimes, not grimes. And I, I think that put it pretty well, actually. You know, Starkey has taken responsibility for what he said. He unreservedly apologised and resigned from all his academic positions. Last time I checked, uh, you know, a lot of the people that you've just mentioned, uh, the the uh, Frankie Boyle show. No one's taken any responsibility for any white anti-white comments that that were mentioned there. And I've made it clear. I think Dr. Starkey's remarks were objectionable. I myself apologised and edited the video to remove the offending passages. Yet still, the police are investigating me and saying I could spend seven years in prison for stirring up racial hatred. Now that's, why would I apologise and edit the video if my intention was to stir up racial hatred? It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And a, an extraordinary amount of taxpayer money must have already been spent on investigating this. You know, the first original complaint was made to Durham Police, then it ended up being sent down here because obviously I'm in London. So how much taxpayer time and, and uh, taxpayer money rather has been spent on investigating this vexatious charge? You know, fight crimes, not grimes. It you can't be any clearer than that, really. Well, no, it's very true. And even, again, as horrible as what the words Dr. Starkey said were, I don't think he was trying to incite racial hatred. No, no, do I. I think it's just his, his generation, unfortunately. And he, unfortunately, he chose to use those words. But again, I had lecturers who would say things like the Iraq war happened because white people wanted to kill brown people. I think that's more likely to start racial hatred than what he said when we, as you mentioned before, the Frankie Ball show, that's likely to kill whitey. That's essentially a stir of racial hatred. And especially when you hear things at university, um, widen racial hatred, people stirring up violence. We have socialist workers parties coming on campus um, when I was at university, calling for a revolution, calling for violent acts of the state. Obviously, you've just had this BLM thing, which called for rioting and sort of, um, even Antifa, the strong must protect the weak. They engage in violent politics and they're not being investigated, despite what they're saying is promoting crimes. And so it's a complete double standard that sort of conservative pundits such as yourself are being targeted with this, but there's almost the left can do and say as they please and the law doesn't appear to apply to them. It's a two tier system of policing. So I agree that there's definitely an inconsistency uh, and a there's, you know, there's not a level playing field as far as the law is concerned when it comes to left versus right. But I hope the left aren't investigated for this sort of thing. I hope that the left continue to say horrible things that you and I and others will criticise and that we have debates about what they've said, that we uh, discuss what they've said. More speech, more discussion. That's the way that you get rid of bad ideas. That's how, that's how for years and long before either of us were born, that's the way in which we've done things in this country and reached good conclusions and ended up as the fantastic nation that we are by having speech and debate. So I hope the left aren't investigated. I just hope that the police actually refocus their priorities, stop investigating thought crimes, and actually investigate legitimate crime and arrest actual criminals, not those who interview people on, for, on a show in their bloody bedroom. You know, get a grip. It's absolutely pathetic. Well, and it's clear, I think, you were being targeted because even at that stage, as you mentioned, reason it is a large channel and it is growing, but at that stage, you weren't getting a huge amount of views per oh. video. And so someone was clearly sitting there trawling through all your stuff, trying to find something to go after you for. Oh, well, um, Jack, I think they, you know, they, it, it was Dr. Starkey and Darren Grimes. Someone clearly thought two birds with one stone, get in, you know, and went through it with a fine tooth comb. Um, so... And, and then made that complaint to the police. Well, and as well, it's where do we draw the line with this stuff? Because again, while not um, endorsing or uh, justifying what he said, that sort of language was not, not commonplace in say the 1970s and 1980s. And are we now going to go back to them and start getting all of those actors 
for racial hatred, those news reporters, where do we draw the line? Is it only something which is said in 2020? Is it 2019? What was being said in 2010, David Cameron said multiculturalism has failed when he was prime minister. Are they going to go after him? For racial hatred, it's, it's 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 a very slippery slope, and it is of course, concerning to see. Of course, it, it absolutely does. Um, that's why you know I was so pleased to see that even those who, like Ash Sarker and Tim Farron, who, let's be honest, don't like anything I have to say, anything that I believe in, but even they recognised that this is a really dangerous precedent. Um, and I think that that's a good thing, and that does show that that gave me a little bit of. Um, pause for thought and hope and and i i don't mean to sound really soppy when i say that but it just goes to show that the culture wars they don't have to be the end of us you know they don't have to divide us completely there are agreements that can be had on fundamental principles like free speech and free expression you know ash Zarka clearly recognizes despite the fact that she's a communist that her channel for want of a better way of putting it, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, but would be up shit creek without a paddle if if she was to uh, be investigated uh, or complained about every time she said something controversial or had a guest on her show or whatever. And Tim Varon, isn't it nice to see the party that did all it could to overturn our vote for Brexit, to deny democracy, literally saying bollocks to our biggest vote for anyone or anything, remembering the fact that it has, it's a party that's history is soaked in that liberal tradition. And that must mean that it defends principles like free expression. So I was delighted to have unlikely bedfellows, like not literally, of course, like Tim Farron <laughs> and Ash Sarka. I was really delighted about that. Um, so all is not lost. That's what I would say to TPUK. No, certainly. And it's definitely a message for hope that we can get through to the other side. And there is possible cause to work or at least negotiate with the other side on certain policies. Um, again, moving on to a new topic, you mentioned sort mm. of earlier in the interview about your work with Defund the BBC. Would you like mm. to explain that to our viewers a little bit? And what do you think about the BBC? Do you think it can be saved or is it sort of <laughs> going downhill? Um, uh, so I, my story uh, uh, and background with the, the BBC goes back quite a long way, actually. I, uh, my first introduction to the licence fee was when uh, my mum, uh, she went through quite a nasty divorce when I was, uh, I think, just going into secondary school, uh, starting comp. And uh, we were quite, she had to remortgage the house and pay out her ex-husband. So we were quite poor at that point, you know, single parent family. And there were three kids. So she unplugged the telly uh, and we were using a food bank. You know, it was, it was pretty horrible times. Time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she unplugged the telly and she said, right, well, we're not, you know, we're not watching it. So we're not paying it. Cancel the direct debit for the license, and, uh, the license fee. And I remember them coming round to the door and it's quite a threatening way in which they do it. And I, I can remember even then, even as a child thinking, there's something not right about the fact that there's this flat level, no matter how much you earn, you know, you can be Lord Alan Sugar, you can be my ma'am, and you pay the same amount of money of taxation for watching a television in an age of, and obviously it wouldn't have been in an age of Netflix back then, but you know, YouTube and everything would have been a thing. And in an age when the broadcast and landscape had changed beyond all recognition, back when my mum was born in 1969, house number 48 could have caught on to house number 47, which was paying for its license fee by attaching a coat hanger as an aerial from its television and hijacking their connection. So back in the day, that before technological advancements like what we've experienced in the broadcasting landscape today, there was a need for a license fee. There was a need to actually ensure that 47 can't hijack number 48 signal. And I get all of that, but this is 2020. This is the age of Netflix and Amazon Prime. This is the age when 
the BBC, uh, with its brand recognition around the world, could actually capitalise, uh, as far as the international broadcasting landscape is concerned, on its unprecedented and, and I think very hard to compete with back catalogue. It's a back catalogue that's so rich and goes so far back that they will be able to find many customers with many different tastes to actually access it. So I'm, I think, more optimistic for the BBC as a cultural conservative who doesn't really like destroying institutions for its future if we get rid of the license fee. Because I say the license fee is actually holding the BBC back. We can unleash a whole world of potential for the BBC, which I think is the United Kingdom, one of the United Kingdom's soft power superpowers. It's a brand recognition that extends far beyond the United Kingdom shores. You know, unleash that potential, get rid of the license fee, allow people to subscribe to it from beyond our shores. And I think the BBC would reap the rewards for that. So, you know, I'm optimistic for the BBC and I want the proponents of the license fee to join me and not hold the BBC back. No, certainly. And I think there's an argument that if it did become a fee paying um, service, we'd be able to see the type of content it produces change because no one I certainly more in I know. touch. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because the sort of woke stuff that they're producing at the moment is propaganda. It's leftist propaganda at all levels, whether it's on the news, whether it's on <laughs> on their sort of social shows. Um, and it's concerning actually that, that is being broadcast to people and that is the only thing some people watch certainly with my gran that was the only thing she watched for a while before i said look there's some other news channels out there and you get a very filtered um filtered take of what's going on like when they choose not to report about yourself or when they selectively report on protests or when they selectively report on trump they're mm. manipulating particularly the elderly population and so if we had this sort of fee paying subscription they wouldn't be able to just redo what they sort of studied at university and what they what makes them feel good they'd have to actually cater to the audience and be held accountable i think you're spot on actually and i think that's no clearer than the bbc's decision despite promising that they wouldn't do this to the cameron government uh going after the over 75s because they recognize that it's people like you and i who our generation that don't pay for the license fee that won't pay for the license fee but the over 75s who rely on their television sets to combat loneliness who won't know what the legislation says you know if you don't watch live television you don't have to have a license uh, or bbc iplayer you don't need a license fee not a lot of people realize that and might not be watching uh, live television as it turns out i do watch live television so you know when i want to watch newcastle united get thrashed in real time i've got no choice but to pay for a license fee well, i think we but noticed I'll... certainly what you highlighted there going after vulnerable individuals when i was yeah. at university living in halls in the license fee they address a letter to every student on campus and obviously people who are switched on such as myself or my friend we didn't pay because we know we don't even have a tv point that plugs in in there but they said everyone who lives here has to pay the license fee so they're getting all the international money coming in and paying for it they're getting maybe the disabled students paying for it because they're scared about people coming after them and it, certainly that there is this sort of theme of targeting the vulnerable because they know that it's again it's a scam of what they're doing what they're charging and it's it, it's completely disgusting that it is a tax on the vulnerable and I think overwhelmingly the British public in, in the latest round of polling don't think it's a good value for money. You know, the, I, I noticed that before the BBC's rich list was announced, the latest set of millionaires that we've all paid for, uh, you know, Zoe Ball getting a, a, a pay rise of uh, almost £900,000 for losing a million listeners. That's extraordinary. In the private sector, that would never be allowed to happen. So he would lose a job. But because the BBC was scared about their gender pay gap, they've ended up paying a, a million quid more for losing just that about the same in listeners. That's extraordinary. Um, so I think you're right. I think it's a regressive form of taxation. I think the land uh, broadcasting landscape has changed beyond recognition. It's unjustifiable. Um, and to be honest with you, Jack, it's one of those weird things that I just think you've got an 80 seat majority, Boris, what the hell are you doing? Well, certainly when you've got people like Gary Lineker who are paid more than the prime minister, that exactly. screams that something, something's wrong. Yeah. Um, sorry. I know what I was just going to say, and I think there are many footy fans actually that watch uh, Gary Lineker on their sets and just think, 
you know, I, I don't I don't care about your politics. I quite liked it when football commentators I didn't know their politics. It sort of shatters the illusion a little bit. I just want your football commentary, thank you very much. And they're trying to obviously tell Gary Lineker that he can't tweet uh, blatantly partisan opinions anymore on everything from the English Channel to Brexit. And he's basically saying, tough luck, buttercup, you know, it, like he's too big to fail. And when the BBC finds themselves in a position like that, I think public opinion before too long is going to be overwhelmingly on the side of you and I. Oh, no, definitely. And I think the BBC needs to realise people are moving away from needing sort of A-list celebrities or I guess Z-list, <laughs> Gary Lineker, um, reporting things. That as long as it's a good show and as long as the content's good, people will watch it. And so we need to stop letting these sort of elevated celebrities hold the British taxpayer to ransom, demanding huge sums of money to put out their political propaganda. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it needs massive reform. I, and I don't care how much these stars get paid, right? If the market suggests that they are worth their salaries, fine. But the licence fee payer shouldn't be forced to pay for it. You know, the licence fee should payer shouldn't be threatened with prison for not seeking to or not wishing to fund the salary of Gary Lineker. Oh, definitely. And I think when they forced out the only right winger, Andrew Neil, from the BBC. Exactly. Um, again, what is the point of any Conservative paying? Bring on GB now? News. Exactly. That's all I say. But on that note, Dan, I think we've run out of time. But thank you very much for coming on today. Uh, thank is there you anything? very much for having me. No, I just want to say thank you for to, to you and Turning Point for your support uh, over the last week, but also to, you know, the viewers who I've, my email box has been packed to an extent to which I, I haven't been able to actually reply to everyone, but uh, just know that I'm eternally grateful to all of you for your support. And I think the the recognition that this is really important, this fight, and I'll keep you all updated. But again, from the bottom of my heart, to Turning Point UK and to everyone watching, thank you so much. And let's take this on and fight it because it's a really important principle and it's a precedent that we've got to resist. So thank you. So thank you again, Darren, for coming on today. Thank you.